right. Um, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, as usual, this is the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, the, the theme for tonight's uh, class, by the way, we missed last week's part. Sorry for that. Technical difficulties beyond my control. Uh, so we didn't get to discuss this last week. So tonight's theme. Tonight's theme is called, at least the Sanskrit word would be alamkarika or alamkaraka. And what that translates as is adornments, <laughs> like decorations. <laughs> think, think of a Christmas tree, <laughs> adornments. That's the theme for tonight. And um, well, obviously, I have a lot to say about that subject. But before I do that, I want to just make sure everybody is aware that, of course, tonight is a full moon. And it is the full moon in May. And what that means within Buddhist communities is that it marks the beginning of Vesak, as the holiday is called. This is a holiday that will be celebrated tomorrow. But the 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 astronomical event that signals this is the full moon in May. And what Visak is, is a celebration of the Buddha's birthday, the Buddha's day of enlightenment, and the Buddha's Pari Nirvana, or the passing away. And coincidentally, <laughs> those three events all happen on the full moon in May. So that's a celebration today. And what that means from a Buddhist point of view is that it's a excellent night for Dharma. <laughs> it's an excellent night for contemplation and meditation because that's the very thing the Buddha was doing on this very night underneath the Bodhi tree. Uh, so that'll be fun and beautiful. And I feel really honored always to kind of teach Dharma on significant days like this. So very grateful to SFDC, all of you to be here to kind of celebrate this uh, most auspicious night uh, with me, with us. So thank you all. So on that note, let's dive back into the Dharma. So th because this is Dharma Doors, what we've been doing is looking at a Buddhist sutra. That's what I'm interested in doing is introducing different sutras. We've been working on this one for a while, and it's a sutra that's about the Bodhisattva path. And we've been investigating all of these different aspects of being a Bodhisattva. And tonight, that aspect will be about the adornments of a Bodhisattva. It's going to come up in the reading. I have a little a reading to do that's from the sutra. And this idea is going to come up. And it's really, you know, an interesting idea. But before we dive into that, I want to give you some background on the theme. I, I started to become, I became interested in this topic a number of years ago. It was one of those conspicuous ideas that just kept sticking out in different sutras. And in particular, um, well, actually, I won't go down that road. I just looked down that road and we'd be here all night. So, but the idea is, is that within the Bodhisattva path, they talk a lot about, well, it gets used a lot of different ways. They either talk about the adornments of a Bodhisattva. They talk about Bodhisattvas doing adorning, by which it kind of sounds like even beautification, almost like art in a way. And they talk about bodhisattvas giving adornments. This is very related, by the way, just to let you know, there's a related word called a vyuha. And a vyuha, and actually even the name of the sutra that we're reading, it's about the bodhisattvas uh, guna vyuha, a array of virtues. And this word array or of, 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 of a, an array of virtues is kind of like a, you could think of it as a, a bouquet 
is an arrangement of flowers. So that's a kind of an array, and that's a form of beautification in a sense. And so since the basic idea of this sutra is about the, the beautification of a bodhisattva's Buddha land, in which they are adorned, or they adorn, or they give adornments. So it's all this language about adornments and adorning. And, you know, if you see Mahayana Buddhist images of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, they are often wearing uh, necklaces, bangles, uh, bracelets, all kinds of things. And in case I forget, those are depictions or I iconographer iconographic representations of these adornments but it could be it's complicated because i don't think they're necessarily talking about wearing necklaces <laughs> in fact that's where i want to start tonight i want to start with the little bit of background about where this idea of adornments is even coming from if you've been to Dharma Doors lately, meaning if you've been to any of these sessions regarding our sutra about beautifying Buddha lands, then you know that we've, we've done a lot of talking already about the difference between early Buddhism, the so-called Hinayana, the little vehicle, and later Buddhism, the so-called great vehicle or Mahayana. And the sutra does a lot of comparison of those two paths. And, you know, that's part of what's going on with these sutras. It's part of what's going on with the bodhisattva path is that it's a, it's a different path. It's a different vehicle. It's a different means to enlightenment than the Hinayana. And so where I want to start tonight is the the role or the place of adornments within the Hinayana. And you may know, you may know this already because you may have taken certain precepts, don't know, but there's a certain precept, there's a certain rule, prohibition, or if you will, within the Hinayana, within the kind of early Buddhist path, there's a rule against wearing adornments. Specifically, it's actually a kind of a rule against adorning the body. And it has a kind of wide range of mm, mm, interpretations, applications, by which I mean jewelry is understood to sort of be out, um, perfumes, um, ointments, just various ways to gus gussy up <laughs> the body, so to speak. Within the Hinayana, those were prohibited or forbidden. And so what seems to have happened within the world of early Buddhism is that adornments and adorning they get a bad rap, <laughs> meaning they're they kind of begun. They have a connotation of being defiled to use or unwholesome to use the language of the Hinayana. In fact, that's exactly how they would be defined in terms of them being a precept against or avoiding them. That would mean that they were an unwholesome thing, an unwholesome dharma in that way. Now, what's fun? and funny and interesting is that you may be familiar with a wonderful Mahayana Buddhist sutra called the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, otherwise just known as the Vimalakirti Sutra or the advice of the layman Vimalakirti. And this is a wonderful Mahayana Sutra Many, many months ago, even maybe years ago now, I did a series for SFDC on this sutra with Michael Taft. Really, that was a great series. And there's a really fun, funny 
moment in that sutra and that sutra is you know it's full of all of these miracles all of these like wild things going on and at a particular moment midway through the sutra this miracle happens where all of these beautiful flowers miraculously start falling from the sky and start falling on the audience and all of the monks all of the representatives of that early hinayana path all of these flowers start sticking to them and they are basically becoming adorned with flowers and they are desperately trying to get them off <laughs> and they they can't because they're actually quite special flowers in that sense and a very wise female bodhisattva says to one of the monks, why are you trying to get these flowers off of you? And the monk says, because they're defiled, because they are un, uh, an unwholesome dharma. And this female bodhisattva says, no, don't say that. Don't look at it that way. And what what she says explicitly is that actually that's a, a latent attachment, M meaning considering them to be defiled is this even more subtle level of, of attachment in that way. And, you know, this, the Vimalakirti Sutra and where that, where that part of the sutra goes is to a discussion about non-duality in that sense so that's a kind of a little sneak peek to where we're going tonight with these adornments it's this mahayana reimagining of that prohibition against adorning the body and we're going to explore that tonight and then we're going to look at some more of these practices or virtues of bodhisattvas and you know what they what they have to do with with this adornment but from a bodhisattva point of view um yeah let's just should we dive in yeah let me I'm, i'll dive into the text just to make sure that we start making it's very short tonight by the way too there's no no risk of of it going you know over too long or anything like that um but yeah let's get into it actually because the adornments are the second thing to come up so let's deal with the first once again this is we've been dealing with this sutra for a while now and we reached a point in the sutra where the buddha is explaining to a monk named shariputra explaining to shariputra the virtues kind of the merits, the qualities, the, the, the virtues of being a bodhisattva or things that make a bodhisattva virtuous in that sense. And of course, Shariputra being a monk represents this early Hinayana form of Buddhism I'm telling you about. And so the Buddha is kind of explaining to Shariputra, well, this is what it means to be a bodhisattva. And the way the sutra has been going is the Buddha started by telling us one quality of a bodhisattva, then telling us about two qualities, three qualities, four, five, six, seven. And tonight we will learn the eight qualities of a bodhisattva. And furthermore, Shariputra, <clears throat> what are these eight qualities of a bodhisattva? Number one, well, number one, according to one of our sources, is that they have no jealousy. <laughs> that, of course, uh, uh, that's the first reading. And that is a reading of an English translation from the Tibetan. And if you've been coming, you know, I'm kind of toggling back and forth between two different versions of the sutra, trying to kind of triangulate the kind of the essence of its message in that way. 
as I've mentioned in previous nights, for the most part, the Chinese version that I'm reading and this Tibetan version or ch translation from Tibetan that I'm using, for the most part, they're almost exactly the same. It's only every now and then that they depart. And as I've been pointing out, it's very interesting actually where they depart. You kind of learn little things that are different about Tibetan Buddhism than East Asian Chinese Buddhism, for example. So the Chinese doesn't say that the Bodhisattva isn't jealous. That's not number one. The number one, according to the Chinese version, is that they don't delight in nirvana. That one's kind of very different. It's probably one of the most disparate or di most different uh, of the translate, like the things that have been the most different so far. The bodhisattva quality of not being jealous is very, very much in keeping with the other seven of the qualities. So I want you to know that the, the theme tonight, at least a, a general theme beyond these adornments, it's kind of very much going to be about, uh, tonight is very much going to be about relating to others in a very, very kind of um, uh, mm, like very specific way. And so this is a sort of about not being jealous, at least according to the Tibetan. I will use this opportunity of the Chinese version to say something about the Bodhisattva path, though. So in the Chinese version, it says the first thing is, is that the Bodhisattva doesn't delight in nirvana. And this is a very another very important distinction that is made between Mahayana Buddhism and this earlier Hinayana. As you may know, this whole kind of Buddhist <clears throat> project, if you will, the, the, the Buddhist tradition, it has a lot to do with what is called samsara, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, right? the general idea of kind of being trapped in an endless cycle. And maybe this endless cycle is an endless cycle of actually being born and living lives and dying and being reborn and living lives and dying. Or you can think of it as kind of a groundhog's day, kind of getting up every day, being in a cycle, going to bed at night, getting up in the morning, going through that same cycle again, and being kind of stuck in a rut. <laughs> you can think of samsara as being anything from being stuck in a rut to metaphysically being bound in a cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. <laughs> you could think of it as any, anything in between all of that either too. But Buddhism is very much about transcending samsara, getting out or escaping samsara. And you know, just to kind of put it simply from a dharmic point of view, rather than past actions keeping us bound in samsara, which is, which is the normal Indian philosophical way of understanding samsara. It's what you would think of as karma, that idea that one's past actions have led to this cycle. The Buddha comes along and on the full moon night of May, many, many, you know, a few thousand years ago, the Buddha realized that it wasn't past actions that keep one bound in samsara. It's actually present, a present doing. But that present doing is the state of being affected by these three poisons of desirous wanting stuff in the world, of being averse to things and afraid of things in the world, and ultimately being confused about what's going on in the world. So greed, anger, and delusion, and the current 
present state of being, greedy, angry, and deluded, is what keeps one in that cyclical state of samsara. So, to eradicate those three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion, to bring them to cessation, like as if they were three flames that were put out forever, that's called nirvana. That is to escape samsara. That's the Buddhist method, method in a nutshell. Greed, anger, delusion are what keep us in the bad cycles. Putting an end to those is the liberation from that cycle. And that's called nirvana, the cessation of suffering. So something kind of then begins to happen within the world of Buddhism. Samsara becomes bad, like it's a bad thing. And then what that means is nirvana is a good thing. So now we would rather be in nirvana and not be in samsara. So that again is the Hinayana or the early Buddhist project, transcend samsara, get to nirvana. The bodhisattva comes along though, and one quality of a bodhisattva is that they don't delight in nirvana. And you could interpret this a number of different ways. My interpretation of this would be, it's not, and oh, by the way, too, I should mention this. It's a kind of a interesting feature of the bodhisattva that they have, well, and uh, this gets complicated because there are different levels of bodhisattvahood. So I can't say this of all bodhisattvas, but part of the bodhisattva path is actually reaching a certain point where one puts an end to greed, anger, and delusion, has every has every opportunity and ability to completely transcend the world and enter nirvana, but chooses willingly to continue to come back into the samsaric cycle out of compassion and loving kindness for all sentient beings, for having taken the original bodhisattva vow of bringing all sentient beings to awakening. That's the vow. So you got to keep coming back into samsara in order to complete that vow. So what that means from a kind of, uh, well, just a way that you could put that, a beautiful way that the tradition puts that, is that a bodhisattva abides neither in samsara nor nirvana but is in the business of ferrying sentient beings from samsara to nirvana. But they themselves are like a ship's captain that has no country regarding samsara and nirvana. That is a way to interpret this first quality of not delighting in nirvana. It's not that they're not foolish into not understanding that nirvana is different than samsara in that sense. But it's kind of like I was getting at before with my remarks about adornments. Something can start to happen where the mindset that elevates nirvana over samsara starts to become a dualistic mind that has these latent tendencies to be attached to even the exalted state of nirvana. And if it, it's kind of a sense that if it's really nirvana, like really nirvana, then it's more equanimous than that. It's more non-dual than that. It's not that nirvana is good because it's, it's suffering worldlings. 
that are trapped in samsara that put things into categories of good and bad and all of that. So a real nirvana would be outside of such paradigms in that sense. So, all right, everybody okay with the first one? That's just kind of a little, you know, just get us warmed up. So number two, the second, oh, any questions? Yeah, no, sorry. Um, is there any relationship between that and jealousy? Or are they just two completely separate ideas that because I can't I thought of one, but I don't think it's very good. Oh, um that um if if you if you're dualizing samsara and nirvana, then I, I guess I don't I don't know which comes first, which is cause and which is effect, but it relates to wanting what other people have and you know not being satisfied with what you have. Yeah, and my guess is my guess is is that linguistically the Tibetan has something in it that would lend support to your because I had the same suspicion that there might be some sort of overlap there. But Thank you. All right, let's so now let's move on to the second quality of a bodhisattva. And this, of course, will bring us to tonight's theme, which is very simply too. And this is this is identical in the Tibetan and the Chinese. They give adornments. They give yeah. alamkaraka. <laughs> so that would then that's this is what kind of then opens up the talk tonight what does that mean <laughs> that a bodhisattva gives adornments right <laughs> um the verb by the way just linguistically the verb in in both of them is dana so that's our paramita that's our classic bodhisattva practice of generosity or giving but here the bodhisattva is specifically giving alamkarika, giving these adornments. So I wanted to walk us through a few different ways to understand that based upon the research I've been doing into these adornments, into all the various ways that these adornments get referred to and spoken about. So the first thing that I want to mention in terms of my research into this topic is the adornments of a bodhisattva whether they're wearing them uh giving them or placing them what have you the connotation of these adornments it's always about virtuous activity it's always has to do with with virtuous activity by which i would mean from a buddhist point of view things that are in accord with the precepts in that sense. So for example, I always, this is an example I always like to give. It's, and it, it, I like to give this example because it really kind of helps introduce the subtlety of how language is being used in these sutras and in Buddhism in general. So the example that I often give is that it's like the prohibition against false speech. So from that early Hinayana perspective, one of the afflictions, one of the defilements of the mind is the tendency to be deceptive. And I, I won't do it tonight, but I've done it in the past where you can do a lot of interesting vipassana a lot of interesting insight work by examining deception and like really looking at, you know, whenever you find yourself, be, you know, telling a little white lie or maybe telling a real heavy, serious lie, being very deceptive, whatever it is, you could actually really use that as an insight into whatever one is guarding, whatever one is defending, senses of self, all of that. So 
in the early Buddhist tradition, there's a prohibition against false speech, against deception. And the prescription or the recommendation, you know, is sat satya, truth, speaking truth in that sense, being honest and truthful. So from the Hinayana point of view, and I haven't said this tonight, so I'll say it now, in this comparison between Hinayana and Mahayana that we're doing tonight, in this comparison, I often, you know, really point out that early Buddhism was a, a practice of austerity, you know, renouncing, shaving your head, being celibate, being homeless, begging, all of that is an austere practice. It's not as austere as it gets, <laughs> right? Because you could fast for days and days on end. The Buddha suggested one meal a day, but that's still considered a practice of restraint. All of these things, again, shaving the head, being celibate are acts of restraint. And then when it gets to the precepts, like avoiding false speech, the understanding is, is that that's another one of those gross tendencies in that way. And so one needs to like restrain themselves from deceiving. One needs to like make an effort to tell the truth. That's in the Hinayana, more austere, where all of these precepts are more of a uh, discipline. In fact, that's what Vinaya or Vinaya means, disciplined. I want to contrast that version of avoiding false speech with the Bodhisattva approach. So from the Bodhisattva point of view, it's you can almost, and this is tricky, but it's more of this sort of idea that being deceptive is ugly, whereas being honest and truthful is beautiful. It adorns the world. And so the Bodhisattva is in the business of adorning the world with truth, with truth speech in that sense. Similarly, the prohibition against killing, stealing, all of these things, you can approach them as disciplines and as austerities, or you can approach them from this bodhisattva point of view where it's sort of this joyful activity, a beautiful, joyful activity to be honest, a beautiful, joyful activity to be virtuous and be moral in that way. And that all of a sudden starts to be, I don't know, for me, uh, I don't know, more, la la more levity. There's something to that that I resonate with. And it's why I teach Mahayana Buddhism most nights in that way. So that's just a, a little taste of what it what an adornment is often referred to in the bodhisattva path it has to do with moral action things like that but i also want you to know that they also refer to certain samadhis or dhyanas various different meditative states they often refer to those as adorning the mind adorning the mind with samadhis also a very beautiful kind of way of thinking about meditative states in that sense. So now the whole practice, the whole bodhisattva path is it's, it's sort of like both moral and aesthetic in that way. And it's a, I, for me, again, it's why I'm so drawn to this tradition is this kind of merger with, with those two worlds the aesthetic and the moral, this kind of, um, I don't know, I just really think it's beautiful. And I want to share with you how that aesthetic moral beauty gets played out even more. So 
there's another sutra <laughs> that I really like. <clears throat> and this one's called the, normally you would know it as the 10 stages sutra, the Dasha Bhumika sutra is what it's called in Sanskrit. And that's a sutra that describes the 10 Bhumi stages of a Bodhisattva. These are the 10 developmental stages of, of Bodhisattvaness that go all the way from making that initial determination to awaken all sentient beings and attain complete unsurpassable enlightenment. The 10 stages stretch from initially making that determination for enlightenment, and then these 10 stages that culminate in Buddhahood, in being a Buddha. And again, these 10 developmental stages. I'm not going to go into all of that. Some night in the future, I plan to do that sutra and I want to, you know, walk everybody through those 10 stages. It's kind of a very beautiful process or progress in that sense. And it's kind of, it's very complicated. Um, and what I mean is, is that there's a lot to those 10 stages. There are certain practices that go along with the stages, there are certain realizations that go along with the stages. But then, as a sutra, what that sutra does is it employs, within describing each of the 10 stages, after describing the, the, the practices and the realizations of each stage, it uses a, an analogy of gold and what it describes, and I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through all 10 stages, <clears throat> but it says basically that a bodhisattva in the first stage is like a raw you know, nugget, a raw nugget of gold. And after the practices of the first stage, they describe it as a kind of, um, you know, purification process, if you will, a smelting, if you will, of the gold to bring that nugget of gold to a lustrous shine. And then after the second Bod Bodhisattva stage is described, it returns to that analogy of the gold and says, you know, a Bodhisattva in the second stage is like a beautiful, lustrous nugget of gold that a master goldsmith has made pliable. And it keeps going on with these analogies about, you know, a bodhisattva, I forget which stage, but it's a, like a goldsmith that has inlaid that piece of gold with jewels to make the gold shine even more beautiful. And eventually when you get to the ninth Bodhisattva stage, they say the Bodhisattva in the ninth level is like beautiful lustrous gold made pliable and then inlaid with jewels and then formed into a beautiful crown that is worthy of a wheel turning sage king. And then in the 10th stage, they describe the bodhisattva also like gold, also pliable, also bejeweled, also all of that, but made into the adornments of a heavenly God. So it's this beautiful progress in which the bodhisattva themselves is an adornment. And then you get this language of bodhisattvas adorning Buddha lands. And it took me a while linguistically to, to really you know, figure this out, but it's, it seems to be at least a double entendre that the bodhisattva adorns like as in they go around making the world more beautiful, but then they themselves are like a jewel. They themselves are like an adornment that makes the world more beautiful. 
So it's not what they're doing, it's, the, it's what they have done in that sense. So just wanted you to relay, I just wanted to relay those beautiful kind of an, analogies and similes of all of these adornments. But then we get to another meaning of adornment that I think is sort of a very appropriate for tonight, this auspicious night in that way. And that is that if you've ever been to a Buddhist uh, temple or a monastery, and if you've ever seen a Buddhist altar, you may notice it is often adorned there are often vases with flowers there are often at least in east asian uh kind of chinese and japanese and certainly tibetan monasteries there's musical instruments that are on the altar there might be fruit there might be you name it a lot of different things that are placed on the altar and i want you to kind of know that it seems that if you especially if you read the sutras from where a lot of this tradition comes from the creation of a of an altar and the placing of flowers on an altar and basically that whole that whole thing that's all considered adornments that's all considered acts of beautification in that way and it, and in that sense, it does seem that bodhisattvas are in the business of beautifying the world, as in like running around, making it more beautiful in different ways by decorating. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I wanted to mention that then what this sort of opens up is this beautiful kind of artistic lane within the world of Buddhism, where to be an artist and to be in the business of beautifying the world is an act of the bodhisattva, like that that is actually beneficial to all sentient beings to be in the in the business of beautification. So just want to kind of make that extension or that idea. Everybody doing okay with all the the adornments that I'm attempting to shower you with. All right. So um, adornments probably might come back up again, but that was kind of the focus for tonight was that second quality. Now let's jump on over to the third. Um, the third quality of a bodhisattva in this list of eight is that According to, let's read the Tibetan first. They have a vast mind. And yes, according to the Chinese, their mind is broad and vast. So that sort of, I would say, goes without saying in that sense that a bodhisattva has a broad, vast mind. But I will say a few words about that as an idea, I think it's a really wonderful, um, it's a re really wonderful quality to talk about because the opposite of a broad, vast mind is what we would call a narrow mind. <laughs> and we have, a, we have that expression, being narrow-minded. And we all know what it means to be narrow-minded. We probably all encountered somebody that we would call narrow minded. And if we are wise, we've probably reflected on moments when we have been narrow minded. And, you know, narrow minded is, you know, we kind of have another other terms like myopic or like tunnel vision or just this kind of like really being closed in, in terms of thinking, in terms of chitta, in terms of mind. And then a bodhisattva, a quality here is this broad or vast mind. On the one hand, yes, you could interpret that as a bodhisattva isn't narrow minded. Sure, totally. But I would want to add a little more to that idea of having a broad, vast mind. And 
the sort of heavy dharma twist that i would like to put on that is it i i often say i probably say this at some point almost every sunday night but it i will at some point reference the idea that we may have that the self that consciousness that the mind is somehow between the ears and behind the eyes like that idea that where we quote where we really are is somewhere between the ears and behind the eyes as a spectator like as the little pilot as i often say of our life and a few many things um come to a bod bodhisattva a, a few many realizations come to a bodhisattva one of which could be if they were wise in that way one is an understanding from a buddhist point of view that mind or chitta is kind of understood to be an emergent phenomena and that it it actually doesn't really have a, a location <laughs> it feels like it's between the ears and behind the eyes because of the dominance of hearing and seeing but the idea is is that upon reflection upon insight vipassana the mind is realized to be a unlocatable emergent phenomena in that sense and if you really tap into mind as an unlocatable emergent phenomena that can be a very broad very vast mind now flip it and notice how being between the ears and behind the eyes isn't so broad it's not so vast in fact it can feel very constricting at times in that way to feel as if it, it's happening that way and so again the bodhisattva has a broad vast mind everybody good with that excellent number four number four in the tibetan is that they respectfully serve dharma preachers whereas in the chinese it's they honor dharma teachers or that's how i would translate that so this is something we've seen before there's um a beautiful idea and i've mentioned it in a previous night when this came up but the word or the idea that is being translated as a dharma teacher is often in sanskrit at least i don't know about the tibetan but in the sanskrit these people are often referred to as kalyana mitra and kalyana mitra can mean spiritual friends and yes, a teacher, like maybe say me in this capacity, I'm teaching, but I like to be considered just part of the Sangha, of course. I like to be considered a spiritual friend to everybody and, a, a, and consider all of you spiritual friends in our meetings of the Dharma and all of that. And so these Kalyana Mitra, they can be guides, they can be teachers, they can be friends. But it's always kind of understood that they're assisting you, assisting one in the path of the Dharma in some way. And so a bodhisattva honors, respects those Kalyana Mitra. It's a quality of a bodhisattva. By the way, I want to use this opportunity on this one too. I want to make a, I want to remind you this is not saying that a bodhisattva should honor kalyana mitra and dharma teachers it's saying that that's one of the qualities of a bodhisattva is that what that's what they do <laughs> and i think again in terms of like a, a broader theme tonight that kind of hinayana versus mahayana theme i think that that's a good thing to point out that these are not things you need to do 
it's ways that you would know a bodhisattva in that sense and ways to know if you were sort of on the path perhaps everybody feeling good about all those cool cool all right we're halfway through the list number five and i think this is one that's also exactly the same um oh the tibetan was just a little different so i'll let you know the chinese is that the bodhisattva doesn't practice wrong livelihood whereas the tibetan is that they do practice pure livelihood <laughs> so the, the the tibetans are accenting the positive there the chinese are accenting the negative the wrong livelihood um so the first thing that i want to mention to you regarding this list so a few sundays ago we did the six qualities of a bodhisattva and those six qualities of a bodhisattva happened to correspond exactly with the six paramitas so when i knew that we were doing the eight qualities of a bodhisattva i couldn't help but wonder if there was going to be some illusion to the noble eightfold path the noble eightfold path is the most you know important teaching that the buddha gave in eights and so i was looking for a correlation between the two and as far as the eightfold path goes i couldn't really find one except i couldn't help but notice that the fourth step on the noble eightfold path is about right livelihood and this is the fourth step here or sorry the fifth step on the noble eightfold path is right livelihood and the fifth quality here of a bodhisattva has to do with livelihood has to do with either not having wrong livelihood or do having right livelihood so again i couldn't find any other correlations but that one sticks out really conspicuously let's talk quickly about right or wrong livelihood another great example of early buddhism versus mahayana buddhism right livelihood in the early buddhist tradition was very clearly defined right livelihood was to be a beggar to beg for food and i want to remind everybody that originally the term ajiva this idea of what we are calling and what is traditionally called livelihood ajiva means well literally it means toward life ajiva and what that sort of is understood to mean is that which sustains life and so when they talk about ajiva when they talk about livelihood you know we have to keep in mind this is way before you know jobs and resumes and all of that this is way before ideas of livelihood that we have what livelihood meant was how do you survive every day like how how do you get food to eat every day back in the day there were a number of options you could be a farmer you could be an artisan you could have uh, be a um, you know a, a feudal lord meaning a landowner and you could have serfs growing your food there were a lot of options for livelihood and the right livelihood for a buddhist was to daily beg for leftovers that was the right way to live and survive according to early buddhism and that is what created a distinction actually well many things created a distinction celibacy probably num number one among them but the idea of livelihood is what made a distinction between lay householders and the real buddhists the real buddhists at least within the early tradition were the celibate beggars because that was right livelihood and that was right karma or right action meaning celibacy 
The Mahayana, again, is not a tradition of austerity. It's not a monastic tradition necessarily. There is, of course, a monastic path within Mahayana and within the Bodhisattva path, but it is not a requisite. So livelihood takes on a different meaning in the world of the Bodhisattva path. And traditionally, meaning the way it has become understood in the modern world, is that right livelihood for a Bodhisattva for the Mahayana, at least in most traditions, it's anything that doesn't require you to break your precepts. Very simple. So if your occupation requires you to steal, requires you to kill, requires you to be deceptive, requires you to do or take intoxicants, requires you to misappropriate sexuality in that way, that's wrong livelihood. So anything that would basically compromise your commitment to following the precepts. This gets even more complicated though, when we introduce the Mahayana Buddhist idea of upaya, skillful means. Skillful means is this bodhisattva idea, and it refers a lot, actually, uh, this, this Dharma talk's really coming together, because it refers a lot to the earlier remarks I was making about non-duality, the non-duality in terms of samsara and nirvana, the non-duality in terms of defiled and pure, the defilement of adornments or the purity of adornments. So within the Mahayana, you have this idea of skillful means, which is predicated on the idea of non-duality. And all of a sudden, if we're playing within the realm of non-duality, mm, things get very tricky, especially concerning right livelihood and wrong livelihood. So now for the bodhisattva what becomes paramount is not even so much about the precepts it's about that original bodhisattva vow to awaken all sentient beings now all of a sudden it gets more complicated because a bodhisattva's sort of um mission in that sense is much greater than their own personal liberation in that sense, all of a sudden livelihood can take on a whole different meaning. And, or a whole, you know, the idea of right livelihood can take on a whole different meaning. And an example that I give, have given in the past, but an example of the way that this could work Take something like being a bartender. In the early Buddhist path, <laughs> it's a joke. Being a bartender is absolutely 100% wrong livelihood. To be around alcohol, to be serving people alcohol, that's going to be wrong livelihood in the early Buddhist path because of everything that's involved in that. I mean, even where you, where you have to go to work is considered defiled and all of that. In the Mahayana, a situation that I not only can imagine, but a situation I feel like I have even witnessed is a situation in which a, a person who is basically, not basically, is what would be called a recovering alcoholic in that sense. So they have made a vow, made a determination. They're not, they're not taking alcohol. They're, they have oh, transcended it in that sense. But they've actually taken a job as a bartender because they want to make sure everybody's safe. And they know that there are bartenders out there that couldn't care less about the health and well being of the people. So they would just keep serving them shots all night long, getting the money, giving the shots until the person passes out and they drag them out. 
A bodhisattva bartender, though, while still doing this act of serving people alcohol, could be a great bodhisattva, actually concerned for everybody's well being, and actually willingly going into the samsaric realm of a bar, but to, to save sentient beings and doing it skillfully. And what I mean by that is, and this is a great example of upaya, by the way. <clears throat> If somebody were to go running into a bar from outside, trying to tell everybody inside that what they're doing is wrong and da 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 da, how far do you think that person's going to get? How successful, how skillful would it be to do it that way? If you really actually, from your realization about your condition about alcohol all of that if you were like you know what everybody really should should not drink as much again you could go running into the bar screaming it trying to get that to happen or you could actually not come from the outside in but actually be again a bartender on the inside have compassion have wisdom and then employ skillful means to perform your bodhisattva practice. That all of a sudden could be right livelihood. Now, did I say being a bartender is right livelihood? Or did I say saving sentient beings is right livelihood? <clears throat> you, you decide. <laughs> okay, everybody feeling okay about that? Definition of right, wrong livelihood. Excellent, excellent. Number six. Number six here. Huh. Well, number six in the Chinese is that a bodhisattva is equanimous and kind. And the Tibetan is, is that they are humble. But there is a footnote there about that word being tricky. So at number six there, let's just go with the Chinese for now that a bodhisattva has an equanimous, is, is equanimous and is kind. So equanimity, of course, is the name of the game. That's sort of that sweet spot that we are going for. It is, in a way, a type of non-duality, I would say, that equanimity, that equipoise, right? So this is upeksha. This is what is called upeksha in the world of Buddhism. And, you know, I've said a lot about upeksha in other talks, this idea of equanimity. I, in order to just say a few words about it, though, I want to actually talk about the other quality that was mentioned, which is about being kind. So if a really simple way of thinking about equanimity, and there's a lot of ways to think about it, but regarding kindness, and when we're thinking about kindness, this is about, you know, what is called metta, loving kindness in that way. And this, of course, is a practice of Buddhism to be lovingly kind, to practice metta. And a really good way to think about equanimity is about your kindness. And what I mean by that is it's about noticing a few things, but I'll speak about it kind of just two different ways. It's about noticing a, maybe, what would I call it? A tendency or a habit or what have you, but a, a resistance to being kind to someone, some people, whoever it is. And these could be people that you meet. These could be people that you see. These are, you know, whatever it is. But it's about noticing a kind of 
a kindness that we are all capable of, but that a way in which that we might be selective in terms of who we are kind to. And then the flip side, so first thing is notice, notice a resistance to being kind to someone or again, group of people or what have you. And then the other aspect of this is noticing like, like what I wanna say is, is noticing when like you're, you're excited to be kind for someone, by which I mean, it's, it's easy, it, it feels good or whatever. And you know, these are, are, you know, these would be our friends and our loved ones and that. And so what I mean is, is begin to notice if you, if you care to, but you can notice the way in which we have, we can be kind, we are kind, but that we might be, again, selective with that kindness. As if, as if we only have so much of it. And we have to be like, you know, careful that we don't give too much away or something. And I'm here to tell you, kindness is not quantifiable in that way. And again, the, the, I'm, you, what I'm speaking about is what is equanimity? It would be a state of being very equally kind towards all sentient beings. And, and again, the key word there is equally kind. So it's not that I'm like really, really kind to these people. And then I'm a good bodhisattva and over here, I'm gonna still be kind to these people. These, you know, ah, oh, those people, but they deserve my kindness too. And so I, I will be kind to them. No, it's actually about this equanimity, equally being kind to all beings. So a bodhisattva, according to the text, is equanimous and kind. And that would be my kind of interpretation of that. Everybody feeling okay about being <laughs> equanimously kind? Or again, at least noticing as a vipassana, again, as an insight, noticing our kindness and how we might treat it in that sense. All right, two more to go. Number seven is exactly the same in both the Tibetan and the Chinese, so that's fun. The number seven quality of a bodhisattva is that they do not praise themselves. Excellent quality of a bodhisattva never, you know, never really a, a, uh, never really a beautiful trait in that way, kind of self-praise in that sense, certainly something I try to avoid, uh, not to say it doesn't happen in that way, but that's a quality of a bodhisattva. Again, I would recommend using this list as that sense of like how you could spot a bodhisattva <laughs> or how, how you could spot a not bodhisattva in that way. And so this idea of, uh, what do we, what do they say? Uh, big upping oneself, right? <laughs> no, big upping oneself. All right. And let me, yeah, let me just finish the list real quick and then we'll pull out and do a kind of a concluder. So the eighth and final quality of a bodhisattva here in our list is that they, let's see, the Tibetan is that they don't belittle others. And in the Chinese, it's that they don't put themselves above others. So basically the same idea there, belittling versus elevating oneself. I do believe, because I was looking into it, but there is seemingly probably in the original, original, original sutra, there seems to be a play about kind of not elevating oneself, meaning not praising oneself and not putting others down 
in, in these two, number seven and number eight, they seem to be playing with that sort of metaphor of elevating and belittling. So just to think about it that way, that you don't elevate oneself or put others down. I think both of those, are, of course, are great, <laughs> beautiful qualities of human beings to do neither of those things. Um, and certainly, of course, you know, qualities of a bodhisattva. Once again, these are not prohibitions or anything like that. They are just descriptors of qualities of a bodhisattva. And now, unless questions about any of those, pretty straightforward, right? So just to pull back to tonight's theme, this theme of the adornments of the Alamkarika, I think one of the ways that I would read all of this tonight is you could basically read all eight of these as these sort of adornments that I was talk talking about. So what I mean again is, is that you could read that this quality of not belittling others, that that's a way of making the world more beautiful, that that's a way of adorning, or the way a bodhisattva would adorn the world is in that, in that act, but then all eight of these. And so that includes having a broad, vast mind, that that's an adornment or in that sense. Any of these, all eight of these, again, can be seen as these kind of, um, yeah, just this beautiful language about adornments. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about adornments, bodhisattva path, anything like that. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Good. Uh, yes, that idea of the broad mind, mm. you know, it's interesting to think that that in, 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 in focusing on, say, the smallest thing, you know, like, like paying attention to the moment is not a small mind, it's actually quite a broad mind. Mm. And focusing on the moment of the paintbrush or the knitting or the, or the, the performance uh, or just painting, <laughs> like we've been doing, painting, is that moment, even though it may seem small, it's actually quite large and quite broad <laughs> because it's taking away, because it's removing myself, moving self away and staying in the attention. So the broad mind doesn't, for me, is not necessarily the idea of something broad, but also something very minute and, 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 uh, uh, incomprehensible <laughs> inconceivable inconceivable there we go thank you beautiful comment noe i couldn't agree more especially about that idea that it isn't um necessarily this idea that the mind is this giant thing in that sense that i like what you were saying about even the smallest thing in that focusing on it is well, it, what's, it's what brings about the state we were describing of realizing that the mind isn't actually back there like that. It feels that way. And, it, and as I often say, it can feel even more and more like that. And so a, an analogy that I, I've been using a lot lately for exactly that, that push and pull is the uh, analogy of the Chinese finger trap. And that funny thing about if you pull, you get stuck. So you actually need to relax and move inward in that sense. And it's such a, a, a great example because the, the tendency is to pull. The tendency is to try to get out. And your example, Noe, made me think of it. Oh, it's the other way in that sense, but in that focusing, so. Thank you for that. Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Yeah, Jenny, yay. It's such a hard thing 
because we're human. And it puts such a huge pressure. Um, and to go to Noe, like the small thing and then the broad thing, I am writing, I wrote all this down. Um, like the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? It's a small thing. And then what emerges is a behavior that's like the cat's out of the bag before. Hmm. And then there's tremendous suffering when the behavior of just being human, when, it, when it's just like the last straw. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so I just, oh my gosh, it's really a lot. Hmm. And yes, to strive, uh, to be a bodhisattva, and then just allowing that space for breakage, right? Because we're human, it's really hard when we're striving for this, like, uh, this, this bodhisattva path. Mm -hmm. So that's it. <clears throat> You're your mentioning of the, the straw and then relating that to Noe's point, it made me think of another way of thinking about all of this. Noe, your point about the small, Jenny, your point about the straw, that one straw, it may, it's sort of about, I often think about a, 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 a narrow mind that looks at a field of flowers and just kind of sees this blur versus a mind that can actually see every individual flower and actually like not blur that flower into the whole field but can actually attend to the the incredible uniqueness of that flower Noe, that to me is very similar also to that focus but that broadness where you can see so much more than a narrow mind that is actually seeing quote the whole field that way All right, everybody, I think that might be it for me. We made it through our eight qualities. All right, if that's it, that's um, 